Welcome to Life is Spiritual presents the Erica documentary. My name is Baba Zion, and I'm once again here with my beautiful wife, Erica. Erica Mukisakimani, a.k.a. Mama Maisha, O oh, Mami Zion, and Zef. Aha, uh-huh, Mama yes. Zef. Yeah. <laughs> Glory to God. And this is documentary number 32. Yes. Glory to God. So yes. we give thanks for where the Lord has brought us. We are excited and it must have been the Lord because there's no way we could have uh, gotten to this place where we are um, without him. Amen. So before we get started, yeah. shall we start with a word of prayer? Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give thanks for the gift of life. We give thanks for the gift of your Holy Spirit. We give thanks for the gift of righteousness. And we plead the blood of Jesus upon every soul that is under the sound of my voice, spirit, soul, and body. May you preserve them and be their protection as this information goes forth. We pray, Holy Spirit, that Jesus would have the preeminence and that this broadcast would be under your complete administration. And that the word spoken here would be in line with your plan and purpose for the expansion of the frontiers of your kingdom and for the establishment of your people of your citizens that they may be strong in the lord and in the power of his might in jesus precious holy name we pray believing and trusting and church said amen amen amen, amen. yeah um, we spoke about altars in the other documentary and i feel it to continue as the spirit leads yeah so last in the last documentary, we, we stated that a person can be turned into an altar yeah. and start working for the kingdom of darkness. Just like you can work for the kingdom of God, you can rule with Christ in high places, you know. In the kingdom of darkness, there are people who have, who have sold themselves out to the enemy and they are working with the enemy directly. And among those people was my grandmother. She taught me so much about altars and uh, how altars uh, function. And one of the things that I noticed uh, my grandmother doing, she was so dedicated to her altar. And regardless of how hard or difficult a task was given to her, she would make sure that she accomplishes any task that she had been given by her, by her demons or by the enemy. And uh, she was so committed to a point that she would even astro project for days. She would, she would go and, uh, and uh, whenever she wanted to astro project, she would prepare herself and tell our auntie who was attending to her, to her altar to, to watch over her as she travels, that nobody should distract or disturb her. And she would tell her that I'm going to travel for three days. And not not a, a physical traveling, it's a spiritual journey. And that spiritual journey requires discipline. It requires she, commitment. She would meditate. She would she would she would be still for three days. Meanwhile, yes, in one place. Meanwhile, her spirit is moving. Yes. Me, meanwhile, what she's doing... Her the, soul is coming out the, of her body. The that soul is, has sorry. come out of the body. She's attending meetings. She's going for assignments, missions, you know. And then when she comes back, she comes back very powerful, though weak in the body, because she has not been eating. She has been in one place. She has... She has, uh, she has been... Being in one place means pain, you know. They, they are ready to do anything for power. They are ready to do anything to please their gods, to, to service their altar. Look at the level of commitment and sacrifice. Yes. She was willing to stay still and not move and sacrifice whatever f- feeling, whatever whatever distraction. Yes, even if it's you using the bathroom there. And there's uh, my auntie attending to her. You get that level of commitment. Mm. Here, God is giving us few tasks, few assignments. We are too lazy to follow uh, the assignments that God has given us as children of God. Many times, that's where we fail. And that's what makes us feel that the Satanists are more powerful. Yet, in the actual sense, we are far more powerful. We are far more powerful. But their sacrifices are greater. And then there are also principles to be followed. God will not support us in sin. Do not support us in rebellion. 
if we just have to obey and abide by his principles and rules whatever he has told us to do we have to do but if we disobey then we are on our own god is holy so he will not partake of our rebellion and iniquity he will not support it so uh my grandmother she, she like she really taught me how to be committed and serving the enemy is not something like you you can be proud of because first of all the things he's telling you to do are filthy secondly uh he's a hard task master everything he commands his followers to do is painful and costly he will command them to kill the people they love he command them to to enslave the people they love he command them to to afflict themselves to put pain on their bodies like i i, I explained they are rich people that we see who have sold their souls but they are not enjoying they have sold their souls for money for fame for power but they are not enjoying the things that uh, they have sold their souls to the enemy for wow like a person there is a a, a man in in Kampala he has riches he has he has vehicles he has he has homes big homes he has everything but he's not allowed to travel in a car anything that consumes uh petrol that's part of his covenant that's part of his covenant so he will be working with bodyguards and dogs yeah. his family is benefiting because the children are driving the wife is driving he has wives they are driving and he has uh, apartments is a landlord he works with bodyguards and vehicles following him it's just like this hollywood celebrity robin williams yeah rich famous mm mm-hmm committed suicide. Yes. Just like this uh the head the head singer of Nirvana. It was, it was, of course this was a, a while ago, so over yeah. 20 years ago, but still this guy is rich and famous. Yes. And commits suicide. Another one, another man who died in Uganda still. He had wealth, but he was not allowed to sleep in his house. Oh. So he would go and park in his hotel and sleep in the car. No wow. peace for the wicked. No peace. There's no peace. Yeah. It's only it's only the blessing of the Lord that makes rich, and He adds no, no. sorrow. There is to a it. rich woman still in Kampala. She entered into a covenant with the enemy. She she goes asking for rent in in her malls. She has malls and her kids, so she goes to ask for rent. She's holding her shoes in her hand. You may think that this woman is just tired of walking with heels, but that's the covenant. No shoe should touch her feet. I remember yesterday uh last night I usually don't reveal our pillow talk but you did tell me <laughs> yeah. about the testimony of these ladies that were hairdressers. Yes. Uh we we went with you to minister in in uh Kisasi in Kampala church. in church uh-huh. in Kampala. So I shared my testimony and when I shared my testimony a lady got the courage to come out and also share hers. Mm-hmm. Although she shared in Luganda and she told me that I'll translate to our in-law but her story was some rich man influential politician in our country packed at their salon they had a small salon mm-hmm. her and her friend the friend was doing uh, nails and makeup mm-hmm. her she was good at plating hair so this man packed his car mm-hmm. and went to negotiate with them that they close their business that day and go and attend to to his wife mm. so these ladies negotiated and the guy did not even look at money as a problem he overpaid them he gave them what they had never worked for more than enough in more than enough yes mm-hmm. and he said i would love to have you in my house mm-hmm. to take care of my wife mm-hmm. she needs hair treatment uh, massage pedicure manicure mm-hmm. and also makeup so mm-hmm. yeah, they said that's that's our profession sir <laughs> by all means they were that's so excited we they got a good customer so the the gentleman said i would drive you to my home and then my bodyguards would drive you back they said by all means even if you don't drive us back even mm-hmm. if he just drops us <laughs> by the roadside we have money we can bring ourselves back yeah so the gentleman drove them to his home Mm-hmm. and they entered he he made them feel comfortable they were waiting for the wife to come then he said no come and meet my wife so he took them to uh, he took them upstairs, upstairs where mm-hmm. the wife was and guess who the wife was the wife was a dead body 
a corpse. A corpse. So he said, well, do your job. I have paid you. Makeup, massage, paint her nails, do everything. This is my wife. Wow. And they could not reverse because the guy is armed, has bodyguards, and they have already received the money. The girl said she cried while she was plaiting the body's hair. Mm. Uh, she had to undo the hair that she had, wash it with shampoo. The man had everything that mm. the woman was using before she died. So they had to wash the hair. She had to blow dry the hair. She had to plate the hair. They had to bathe the body. They had to massage her. They had to paint the nails. They had to dress the dead body. And, and then from there, the man said, so what do I do for you? Do you want to go back by yourselves or should I send you with the bodyguards? The girls were just crying, speechless. And he told them, should you expose me? Mm. After I have paid you, I will mm. come after you. I have the the ability to, to do it. To do it, yes. And nobody will will, will take me anywhere because he's a big guy. Mm. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> altars. <laughs> That, People are that, ready to do anything. That and house everything. was his altar. Yes, and that room and that woman is the source of his wealth. Mm. He sacrificed his wife for wealth. So See. people are ready to do anything to go ex, ex, to the, that extreme. And I had heard of a, a, a prominent person still who had also sacrificed his wife for power. So when this girl shared her testimony, it, 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 it made everything now clear to me. So I, I started now realizing that, eh, this thing called an altar is not something light because many times you find there are Christians who don't even have altars. Mm -hmm. They don't pray. And how do you survive in this world without prayer? This wicked world, this dark world without prayer. Because it prayer is like the engine of our lives. So when a person stops praying, there's a sign that the enemy is killing that person. The enemy mm. is working against the person's life. Wow. So a person has to be prayerful to survive in this wicked world. That's why you see Jesus that we follow used to pray all the time. All the and time. he tells us to pray without ceasing. Because the moment you stop praying, you're finished. Yeah, he said, men ought always to, to pray, pray and not to faint. Yes. So basically, if you don't pray, you, you, you die. So you he's faint. telling, yeah, you faint. <laughs> he was telling you that basically, you sh your heart should always be pumping. Yes. That's basically what he was saying. Yeah, when your heart wow. starts misbehaving, mm. the doctor start forcing it to. Yeah. yeah. We have to, you, they, they bring the... Yeah. Uh, these the electric machines. things, yeah, to shock you. Yes. Yeah, to, yeah. to get you back going again. Yes. So maybe if you found yourself in a shocking situation, maybe the Lord is trying to tell you something. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, mm -hmm. so never be in a situation where you say, I'm too hard to pray. I feel so down today. I don't even have the energy to pray. My sister, my brother, <laughs> that is a sign that the enemy is at work. He's at work. And his mission is one, to steal, to kill, and, and to, to destroy. destroy. Nothing more, nothing less. He will only give what he has. Has. Satan gives what he has and he doesn't have life so don't expect him to give you life so when you're depressed and you, you result to taking alcohol and taking drugs and smoking and you think that by doing so you're going to forget the pain that you're going through when you get out of that uh, uh, hangover you'll find the same problem or even worse you find maybe even you drank and you overdosed and uh, people took advantage of you they raped you because you were so drunk and now you have added a problem to a problem you have not mm -hmm. solved anything mm -hmm. our solutions are got through prayer as christians when we get on our knees it is warfare and the enemy will do everything to stop you from praying so as a child of god you should make that your lifestyle it should be part of you just like you wake up and brush your teeth and dress Prayer should be part of your life. Never forget to pray. Even when you're driving your car and you feel the spirit, the, sp the spirit is telling you to pray. 
never stop. Just pray. You can pray from within. You don't have to cause a commotion. You know, you don't have to start shouting for people. But you can even pray in the spirit. Mm. You know, God has given us that ability because we are spirit, spiritual beings living in a physical body. So we cannot be limited. Even if you're working in an Islamic institution, you can pray in your spirit. And I'm telling you, if your boss is a sorcerer, they will feel it. Mm -hmm. They will feel the energy around you. They will feel mm -hmm. the power around you. And they cannot stand. They cannot stand the power of God on your life if they are servicing a satanic altar. Mm -hmm. their, their demons will be destroyed. When I was serving in the kingdom of darkness, there was a, a satanic priest called Miraj. That mm -hmm. satanic priest was in the Indian temple. And whenever they are going to pay it the was workers. like a Hindu temple. Yes. Well, Hindu was the yes. religion. Yes, I used to go in that temple. But whenever these Indians, I'm not saying all Indians are bad, whenever they were going to pay their workers, they would take the money to the mirage. And mm. mirage would perform rituals on that money. And mm. then they would take the money to the workers. And I'm telling you, those people who work in Indian companies, Africans, mm -hmm. non-Indians, and even some Indians... Mm. Those, I mean, they're all being victimized by that spirit. And you know, the, the, the name Mirage, it's like, you know, when you're walking somewhere and then it's you a, see something like water and then... It's the an moon, illusion of water it, up ahead. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. And that man would do magic. He would bewitch somebody's hand and the hand becomes gold, yet it is rotting. That is how bad that guy was. And wow. we had students who were coming from that cult. The guy just puts the bag somewhere and the bag disappears and he will tell you that I'll find it home. It has gone home. <laughs> so <laughs> the, 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 the level of commitment and the strength that they yielded from their altars, mm -hmm. you would see the effect, somebody putting the bag and the bag disappearing. And those boys were mathematicians. They, they mm. were good in business. And mm. uh, there's a boy, before the teacher even finishes uh, everything, like, you know, they would give us, they would teach us and then give us assignment. Mm -hmm. The boy would finish all his work. But he was using witchcraft. Mm -hmm. He was so good with math, mm -hmm. mathematics. Mm -hmm. And then they had supermarkets and their businesses were booming. But mm -hmm. they were thriving on witchcraft. Now yes. they are going to give salary to the workers. They have to first bewitch that money. And they give the workers. As soon as a person gets the salary, the children fall sick. The mother mm -hmm. is sick. There's mm -hmm. so many uh, obstacles that in are other coming. In other words, you're unable to move forward in yes, life. Yes, yes. To keep you on the hamster's wheel. Yes. You never progress. Yes. You have to keep coming back for another salary. That ha. means you have to remain loyal. Yes. You have to remain to that, to that a job. slave. Yes. And when wow. they see that what you have is just enough now to sustain you as you're working, then then the, the, the problems, then you start having hope that with the next salary maybe you will save or do whatever you had planned to do with it mm. now wh what these people do when they find out that with their money you've you've made progress because when you start praying that spell has no effect it on your life losing yes. its power but the weakness that the christians have they don't keep secrets so she will start now progressing and progressing and maybe she saves and she buys a car and she wants everybody to see that she has a car and the boss is not happy. So what the boss will do, the boss will promote that person and give them maybe to be the accountant. And there he will make sure the money is misplaced. And then they will make this person to be working to pay the money that she has no idea of how the money was misplaced. That's how they work. So now the person goes back to square one even probably selling the car that she bought with their money. And when they know that now they have taken back everything because the kingdom of darkness cannot service another altar. So they just want to make sure they derail that person and take back everything that she got from them. So once they know that the person has paid and, and the person is now back to where they were, then they, they fire the person. Mm -hmm. So, so um, that mirage used to do those things go to their offices and and start uh, <clears throat> sending spells. And these people, before they, they open up their shops, mm -hmm. they have to perform rituals. You find their gods painted everywhere in the supermarkets, everywhere in their businesses. Mm -hmm. They are so big on altars. And you find a Christian, nobody knows that the person is saved. Yet, in church, they are born again. 
they give their tithes and offering. They are so dedicated in church. It's just for, for showing the pastor that, you know, when they are very humble when they are, they are with the men of God. Mm. But when they go to their places of work, they are, they are, they, they are, you cannot even differentiate between a Christian and a worldly mm. person. Wow. You know, but these worldly people, in as much as they are worldly, they are so dedicated to their altar. You find a person with, with a charm in their waist. Mm -hmm. they, are, they are really servicing it. Mm -hmm. You find this person has painted uh, all the drawings of their gods mm -hmm. in their shop. We, we go to different restaurants. You see, if, if, if it's a Chinese, you will know because all their gods will be paraded everywhere. Mm -hmm. If it is an Indian, you will know the Indian gods will be everywhere. If it is a Muslim, you will know mm -hmm. there, are, there are signs to tell. Mm. Can you tell a Christian story? <laughs> we go to, like you go to, to make a transaction with an unbeliever. It's time for prayer. They will leave you there with your money. Mm. They will go and attend to the altar. You will stay there because an altar is powerful. You will stay there with the money. Even if she comes back and says, I've changed my mind. I'm adding because I realized uh, <laughs> when I was importing this good, I had to incur another cost. You will say, please, I'm ready to pay because the altar is speaking for the person. A Christian can be praying and then they call them, there's a customer here and she will stop the prayer and run. To meet the customer. Then the, as soon as she arrives, they say the customer left five minutes ago. Why? Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's no altar to speak for her. They are not serious mm -hmm. with their life, with their Christian life, because of the grace that God has given us. So we take everything for granted. Things for granted. But the altar is very powerful. The altar, if you service the altar, you can have customers and just chase them away. Because <laughs> in other words, you can many. have so many that there are so many you cannot you, attend to all of them. All of them. It is very possible for a Christian to thrive in the market, in the marketplace, for you to excel. And when they see that you're excelling, they'll start calling you a witch. Because for them, the only language they understand is witchcraft. They will think you have you have a powerful sorcerer that is helping you mm -hmm. to have dominion there. And the other thing that these sorcerers know to do. They are very generous. They know that that principle, whether they are saved or not, once you give to a poor person, you have favor. The Bible says that he that gives to a poor person lends unto God. So they know that by all means, when they give to a poor person, they are going to have favor. Their businesses will thrive. No, no, it's a principle. It, it's just, it just means that a gravitational pull will be... Will be placed upon them they will draw resources yes. will be drawn to them because uh -huh. of the principle the they principle. obey in other words that that thing is not loyal to any particular religion mm -hmm. if you give to the poor you are going to be it's just a, it's like a light switch you hit yes. the light it doesn't matter what religion you are it doesn't matter what even atheists can partake of that thing uh -huh. and benefit from it yes mm -hmm. so my grandmother was also a giver in as much as she was involved in witchcraft, she used to give food mm. to the hungry. Wow. And she never lacked. <laughs> she, she understood. She used to dress the naked with her witchcraft. Everything she would get, she would gather some money to go and, and, and buy some clothes for the naked to feed the hungry. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes she would shelter them, although she would initiate those that she sheltered. <laughs> but, but still, that principle works. <laughs> yeah. It works. So uh, she 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 taught me the power of servicing an altar, and regardless of what she was doing, no matter how maybe she had planned her week or her month, if the spirits demanded for anything, mm -hmm. everything had to stop. Now we are in a situation where God can tell us stop whatever you're doing and pray. Uh, yeah, but you feel like. Stopping whatever I'm doing to pray, whatever I'm doing is more important than prayer. Because many Christians don't know the power of prayer, so they take it as something they can just do anytime when they are free. But the Spirit can be telling you to pray so that you avoid the trouble that is coming ahead of you 
or so that you prepare yourself for the blessings that God is going to give you so that maybe God can can speak to you because many times he wants to speak to us he's not he's not like he doesn't talk he's not like he doesn't hear when we pray but he wants to speak to us but we are not available at the moment <laughs> we have so much to do so when we are not available for God he will not force himself on us so we are saying why doesn't God do this for me why 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 is it that i i don't get encounters why is it god is calling you and you you're rebelling you're not obedient mm. to his call you're not paying attention to to his invitation so he will wait for you when you're ready for him then he will speak you, you see so many christians are in that position that's why they are struggling yet they are not supposed to struggle when we are in the presence of god that's when things happen that's when we excel that's when we thrive that's when we go high many times we we rely on our own strength that's why we get weary and tired we we get we get we we, we work so hard and we adam started sweating the moment he left the presence of god the moment he disobeyed he started sweating god said mm-hmm. from your sweat you will eat but before when he was with god he was not sweating to eat mm. so it can get to a point where you don't have to sweat to eat mm. and how how do you get there your commitment to god your obedience to him your 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 dedication and availability to god will put you in that place where you, the things that people struggle to get you don't struggle to get because he's 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 sufficient he's 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 our provider he's our protector but how do you get that protection the moment adam left god he started experiencing death the moment the moment we realize that we are in a fallen state and we come back to god and we we obey and we get back to where he wants us to be then there are some things i'm not saying that we will not die the body can die but the soul the soul can live and only god has the power to give you life and life eternal the enemy once he gets hold of your soul there is <laughs> see you have your soul is very is very precious but should the enemy get hold of that soul releasing it is a matter of life and death i'm telling you basing on experience i almost lost my life many times in the process of my deliverance trying to regain my soul to get back to myself to where god wanted me to be to where i am today it it has not been a smooth process today i'm giving you the documentaries you may think it has been a smooth journey it's not as smooth as i'm talking i i had to go through i have scars i have i've gone through fire i have i have been in a place where i have lost everything i have been ashamed i have been judged i have been it is it is so difficult to get back that pressure thing that god has given once the enemy holds it but by the grace of god and by the blood of jesus today i can sit here and say that it is possible for you to get back to where you were with with god you know it's very possible if you determine because there's one thing of a pastor praying for you and people standing with you in prayer but you also have a role you have a, you have to do something for you have to you, it's it's salvation is personal people can pray for you all they want you can keep falling and falling and falling and falling and rising but when you don't decide in in your in in your heart and say enough is enough i want to serve god i want to do everything possible to make god happy you know because when you please him when god is pleased with you i'm telling you your life your life changes and you can tell you can tell from the fruit the bible says you will know them by their fruit the fruit is of course the 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 the, the bible talks about the fruit of the holy spirit but also even their life my life reflects god when people look at me they have to see god the god in me so you god can never put himself to shame you cannot serve him in vain his word is always true 
you know, whatever he promised, he will accomplish. Look at all the men who pleased God in the Bible and look at their lives. Look at Abraham. When God told him to leave his father and mother and he did so and God led him to another land, look at what happened. After he mm. obeyed, he started living in abundance. God blessed him. In fact, when he had to separate ways with his brother Lot, he told Lot, choose any 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 place you want to go because Lot was was depending on what the eyes were telling him he was depending on the flesh so he he, he was depending on his strength so when he saw that the, the other land looked pleasant and more uh, much better and 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 more fruitful he followed his eyes Abraham depended on God and every time we depend on God as our source and we service and Abraham was also a man of altars yeah every time Abraham had an encounter with God he would raise an altar right there at that spot yes and in fact that's one of the things that any Christian any anyone who loves God if you are wise you'll do this thing that anywhere you have an encounter with God an encounter something that really changes your life you raise an altar at that specific spot. Now, I'm not telling you to, you know, start putting rocks stones. and stones and together and have a physical, you know, altar. I'm telling you that you develop a consecration based on that encounter that you had. So you can say that, oh, because I had an encounter, maybe it was on Sunday at around 3 p.m. Uh, something took place. Now, every you can decide that every Sunday at about 3 p.m., You'll be praying for one hour. Why? Because of the encounter that you had. Yeah. You understand? So you basically, what you have done there is you have raised an altar. And on that altar, you offer something. It costs you. It will cost you something. Because there's no business at the altar if it didn't cost you anything. Yes. So at the very least, it will cost you your time. Mm -hmm. So you will commit your time every Sunday at 3 p.m. And man, as soon as you commit to that thing, mm. you'll be amazed how opposition comes. Programs. Things will show up. Situations. The children that got to go to the hospital. What If it's not this, it's that, it's the other. You will fight then to keep that commitment. And that's how you really begin to realize that there is a real spiritual war. Because right there at that 3 p.m., right at that specific moment, other programs are showing up. And they're showing up with power. So that that just tells you right there that not only are those spirits aware, other spirits aware that you have a consecration, but they are trying to distract you from keeping it. Yes. Because spirits understand the language of commitment. Yeah. They don't understand the language of, oh, uh, I'm, I'm late. In fact, the whole, the, the idea of even being late, it's something that's very, very human. Spirits don't tolerate that nonsense. Yes. Once you once you make a commitment, you keep your Time. commitment so much so that Abraham was told by God to circumcise all his all his boys. Yes. Now, when Moses had a child with Jethro's daughter, yes, he forgot or he left out or he neglected to circumcise the boy. It was God who was coming to kill J Moses. Mm. He said Moses. He said God sought to slay Moses, start, sought to kill Moses. Yeah. And what happened? His wife quickly took a stone and okay. circumcised the boy and threw the foreskin at Moses and said, you are a bloody man to me, you know? Mm. In other words, the, the that's what she had to do to save his life. Otherwise, he was dying, man. He was a dead man. True, because yet he was, yet God, he's, he's God's servant. Yeah. But that's the nature of the covenant, the spirit. You don't make a, an agreement with the spirit and fail to keep it. You're joking. Because with altars, there are covenants. Of course. Yeah, you can you cannot have an altar and, and, and there's no covenants on that altar. Yeah. So God is a covenant keeping God. Hmm? It's on those altars that you covenant your children. Hmm? It's on those altars that you covenant your business. It's on those altars that you covenant your marriage. Mm -hmm. You covenant everything that you hold dearly on that altar. On that altar. So, and every covenant has a definite consecration. What yes. is the payment for this covenant to seal this deal? There must be something. There must be an exchange. What? What is the covenant? What is? What is the token of your covenant? Yes. So, uh, you, you like me when I when I covenant my children, I tell God they will serve you. Because that's a covenant. I'm dedicating them so that the enemy does not touch them. 
they are covered, they are protected. In exchange, they will serve you. Mm. When uh, uh, ha, uh, is it Hannah was praying for a son, mm. she went on the altar, but she entered into a covenant. Mm. My Samuel, once you give me, once you open my womb, I will give you this child. I will mm-hmm. bring this child back to you. Mm-hmm. This child will be yours and mine. Mm-hmm. So that's a covenant. You see what she understood and what we're supposed to grasp. You see, every time there's a story in the Bible, you're supposed to grasp the principle. Yeah. So he he won't tell you the principle straight up. He'll just tell you the story. And there's a reason why he's doing that. So that you press in and so that those that are not hungry for God can be pushed out. He wants yeah. a specific, he wants quality, not quantities. He doesn't care about the numbers. He can make people out of stones. So the story is there to tell you that this woman made a deal with God. Mm. And she kept her end of the bargain and he kept his end of the bargain. Yes. And if you are wise, you will learn that it's possible to do business with God on that level. Transact. Yeah, transact. So you'll say, Lord, I need A, B, C, D. I'll make a deal with you. If you do this part, I'll do my part. And every period that we agree on, I will show up with my part and you show up with your part. And in this way, we do business yes. at the altar. Yeah, I told God, give me the children. I will raise them the way you want me to raise them. In exchange, they will serve you. Mm. And even if a lesbian came and started talking to my daughter, I'm not scared. You know why? Because I have told God, Zoe will serve you. Mm. And Zoe cannot serve God when she's a lesbian. Exactly. I just go back to the (laughs) altar and say, Zoe. (laughs) <laughs> there is a covenant on your life. Yeah. You have to serve God. And uh, when you are a lesbian, God will not work with you. In fact, at that altar is where we will do warfare yes. and judgments and pronounce judgments. Because anything that is attempting to violate that covenant, you can fight against it at the altar. You can remind God of the covenant that you have. And how you have and, raised the child. In- and how you have kept your part of the covenant. Yes. And forces will be unleashed upon anything that is fighting against that child. And before you know it, that child has come back into line. Yeah. A lot of parents are frustrated out there because they never covenanted their children. And it's not too late for you to covenant them. Mm-hmm. Because they are 30 or 40, you can still covenant them to God. You can say, mm-hmm. now God, I didn't know. Your word says my people perish due to lack of knowledge. But it Mm. also says we shall know the truth and the Mm. truth shall make us free. Even before that, I covenanted Erica's womb. I said no rebels will pass here. Yes. I said no devils will pass here. He covenanted that womb unto the Lord. That only the servants of the Lord will pass through this womb. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, that womb belongs to the Lord. Yeah. Because we covenanted it. And every child that passes through there belongs to the Lord. It's already covenanted even before the child is conceived. Mm -hmm. And in this way, we save ourselves a lot of problems. Yeah. Satan is looking for places where there are no covenants. Remember, you know, Satan, the position that he occupies is the position of a magistrate and a ruling potentate. And that is basically a legal ruler. He rules based on laws. He understands the technicalities of law. Yes. You know, the spirit realm is a very legalistic realm. Yes. Yeah. So he understands the power of covenant, the power of contract, the power of altars. He sees where no al- no altar is and no covenant is. He can take over that life. Now look at Samson in the Bible. Mm. When God was talking to the mom, there was a covenant. There was a deal. Yes. I'm giving you this boy. Mm. This boy is going to be a deliverer. He's going to fight for, for God's children. He'll be a judge. He'll be a judge. Mm. I've given him that. Mm. I've given him strength, supernatural strength. But in exchange, in this covenant, to show that we are loyal to each other, mm. no razor should, should touch his head. This boy should not take uh, should not take strong drinks. No alcohol. No mm-hmm. alcohol. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, this boy should be That is the Nazarite vow. In yes. other in other words, if he keeps those two areas of the covenant, the power will keep flowing through the altar. Yes. But the moment he violates one area of that covenant, it's the, finished. The power suddenly stops flowing. Yes. And you can tell that Samson was not a very big man in terms of muscles. He was, Why? Because the, the Philistines were asking, where does this guy get his power from? That yeah. means that Samson was a skinny guy. He yes. was just a he was just a skinny, normal looking guy. But when the spirit But when the spirit comes upon him, 
they couldn't understand where does this guy get this kind of power. That means he wasn't a muscle man. Yeah. He wasn't a giant. Yeah. He was just a, a, a slim looking, normal looking guy <laughs> with very long hair. And let me surprise With locks. You. So it was like dreadlocks. And powerful people don't look like they don't. They, you don't see it. Like my <laughs> grandmother would terrorize the village. And when people were sending people to come to her, they were expecting to find a big woman. Mm. She was shorter than me, very small and very light skinned and beautiful. <laughs> so you would find the opposite. But the, what the things they have told you that woman is doing, <laughs> you expect to find a big, huge, black, Mama. maybe dark skinned uh, with all kinds of paint in their face. No, very light skinned, short, small mama. But when she says you see. Terrorist. <laughs> <laughs> so the people who do exploits don't look like the exploits. Samson was looking like any normal person, but there's a covenant on his life. There's a covenant, and that covenant is why he has that strength. And there are rich people. Their wealth is not just normal. Mm. It's, 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 it's a covenanted wealth. Mm. They have to service an altar for their wealth. They mm. keep sacrificing the people they love. Mm -hmm. They keep sacrificing their children. They sacrifice their wives. They sacrifice for that wealth to stay with them. There's mm -hmm. a covenant. Now, we as Christians, Jesus has already paid the price. We don't have to do so much, you know, to, to attain. But all we need to do is to be obedient to the word of God. And, and how do you know what God is saying? You have to get time and spend it in his word and know what God is saying. There is no shortcut in life. If you try to get a shortcut, you'll be struggling and struggling and struggling. Then you'll be deceived. You end up finding yourselves in the hands of false prophets. Those who will be promising you air and uh, in exchange for your money. So you will be, you will be hitting the wall. You will travel nation, sow a seed, a mega seed, a financial seed. Bring your first fruit, bring your last fruit, bring your middle fruit, bring all the fruits that you have. You know, they'll, they'll take advantage of you because you want shortcuts in life. Mm -hmm. But if you spend time in the word of God, you will know what God wants for you. And you will know his plans for you. And you will know how to consecrate yourself. And you will know how to get things the right way. That's why he tells us to meditate on, on, the, on his word day and night. And observe to do according to what is written therein. Mm -hmm. And then he will make our ways prosperous. Actually, as you, you will make your own way prosperous. Yes. He said, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein. In day and night. So that is a minimum of at least twice a day where you're spending time meditating in the scriptures. Yeah. And he says that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. So in order to do all, you must know all that is written therein. All right. According to all that is written therein, for then you will make your ways prosperous and you will have good success so you see you are the one who made your way prosperous because you kept his word but to keep it you must know it and to know it you must give it time yeah. and that is a sacrifice also mm -hmm. to sacrifice the game sacrifice memorizing all of the stats in the game. you'll be amazed how people have statistics of the games that of soccer games football games that have been played in in, in 1985 Guys have statistics, mm -hmm. but they don't know the names of the heroes of the Bible. Mm. But they still want their lives to move forward and they can't understand why they're basically enslaved. Yeah. They're in a slavery system. So keeping you meditating in God's word, it will bring you to a place where you know the principles, the system of God's of, of spirit life. You will understand the power of the altar. You told me about a king who sacrificed his daughter. He was not God-fearing. No, it was his son. His, his son. Mm. He was not God-fearing. Mm. He, he actually, God had given the children of Israel power to mm. destroy them. But because of the sacrifice he made, the, the, the children of Israel had to turn back. Because of that sacrifice, he ended mm. up killing his son, the heir to the throne. Exactly. In fact, it's in 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 27. When they came to the camp of Israel, the Israelites rose up and smote the Moabites so that they fled before them. 
But they went forward smiting the Moabites even in their country, and they beat down the cities, and on every good piece of land cast every man his stone and filled it. And they stopped all the wells of water and felled all the good trees. Only in Ker Hariseth left they the stones thereof. Howbeit the slingers went about it and smote it. And when the king of Moab saw that the battle was too sore for him, he took with him seven hundred men that drew swords to break through even unto the king of Edom, but they could not. Then he took his oldest son that should have reigned in his stead and offered him for a burnt offering upon the wall. And there was great indignation against Israel. And they departed from him and returned to their own land. All right, so what does that tell you right there? Because Israel, they had asked the Lord, Lord, shall we go up against the Moabites? The Lord said, go up, for I will surely deliver them into your hand. And Israel was winning. It was exactly as the Lord had said. However, when the king of Moab decided to sacrifice his firstborn son who should have reigned in his stead. The boy he had groomed. To be the, he was a prince in Moab. He offered him as a burnt offering. Obviously, that's not an offering unto the Lord. That is an offering unto Satan. But still, because of the potency of the sacrifice, because of the love he had for his son, and because of the size and scale, you know, according to the value of the shekel of the temple. In other words, in, in, as far as the value of that sacrifice, mm. it released power. And when that power was released, the Bible says there was great indignation against Israel. And yet Israel had been sent by God. Mm -hmm. So there are laws that are set in place here. That either side can win. Yes. But they need to apply the principles. And it looks more like this, the kingdom of darkness usually applies the principles better than mm -hmm. the kingdom of God. No wonder Jesus was saying the children of the world are wiser in their generation than the children of the kingdom. Why? They understand the principles of sacrifice and they're willing to apply them. Now the king of Moab sacrificed his firstborn son upon the altar and what happened a great amount of power was released he understood that if he can offer a sacrifice that is just mind-blowing a lot of power can be released and a lot of these businesses that you see doing big business people in positions of power what and what have you when they're not in the kingdom they're in the world there's a sacrifice behind it yes. and not only is there a sacrifice but that's the money that comes it's not the money that made them powerful. It's the sacrifice yes. upon the altar. It released power and the money followed the power. The position in government followed the power. Yeah. It's the, uh, and when we grasped that, our gone. lives changed. Your li yeah, when we grasped that, our lives changed. See, for God so loved the world. What did he do? He gave, he gave his, his only, only begotten, begotten son. son. That is the sacrifice right there. That's, That's the reason as to why we are alive today. Mm -hmm. That's the reason as yeah, to so, why I'm saved. So even God, of course, he understands that system. He created that system. Of course, he did not intend from, he did not desire for man to be in this fallen nature. Yeah. But the principle still stands. And even he, almighty God, ab applied. abides, applied that same system. And do you know that he, when Abraham was willing to offer his son Isaac yep. upon the altar, mm -hmm. it was a major statement. Yes. That exact place where Abraham was about to offer uh, his son Isaac, mm -hmm. that is the exact same place where the Lord Jesus was crucified. Wow. Thousands of years later. Wow. So in the place where Abraham's son was not accepted as an, a sacrifice is the very place where the son of God was accepted as, as a sacrifice. sacrifice. All you know, for us. All for us. So you see what God was willing to sacrifice, the size and scale, the pain of it. If you want power, you got to offer something that's painful. You got to offer something that's close. You don't just, you don't just show up and, and think that there's power. There's nothing like that. There's nothing like that garbage. 
there has to be something that's close to you that you that you offer upon that altar. Prophesy. Yeah. You know, they like prophesy. They like I receive. You Telling know? you. And and when you do that, f- that power is released yeah. from that altar. And this is how people do business at the altar. When you offer your sacrifice on that altar, what you offer is from earth into the spirit realm. What the spirit realm responds with is power that proceeds from the spirit realm into the earth. So the altar is the place of transaction. Yes. How many Christians have no place of transaction? I'm telling you, get your documents, academic mm-hmm. documents, present them before God and tell him, well, this is my profession, but I am ready to serve you in any way that you want me to serve. So avail an opportunity for me. Let me serve and live a purposeful life to give glory and honor to your name. You know, I don't want to follow the system of the world because the system requires me to sleep with my boss, with my employer, to get a job. I'm not going to sleep with no man to be employed. If you see that I cannot get employment without sleeping with anybody, then give me the capital that I need and the connections that I need to do whatever I'm supposed to do without being under anybody, you know? It's a covenant. And when you do this, this is what I'm going to do in exchange. This is a transaction between the both of us. Maybe Mm. when you bless me with the resources, I'm going to take care of the orphans. With my resources, God, I'll make sure that any orphan I come across does not go hungry. Mm -hmm. Or I will take care of those people who are sleeping on the streets. Mm. It's a it's a deal that you're entering into with God. And that once I learned that, that's how I live, that's how I survive. I talk to God before I talk to man. Many people are so quick to talk to man. You will write a, a you will write construct a very long sentence of your problems and then WhatsApp man. Why don't you use that energy to speak to God and and make a transaction with God? Mm-hmm. Make a deal with God because God will never fail you. He will never backbite you. He will never expose you. He will never take advantage of you. The people you're writing to or the people that you're telling your problems, most of them are opportunists. Mm-hmm. They look at you, they see a star. They see your destiny. And then they take advantage of the situation that you're in. So okay. So you want what do you want? Soup? Give me your birthright. I'll give you soup. Mm. Give me your birthright. Mm. And when you say, what, what is my birthright doing to me when I'm hungry and I'm almost dying? So I'll sleep with you for a job. That's when Esau gave up what was most important, his inheritance, yeah. his yeah. heritage. People take their heritage lightly. And Esau they could think, go to his mom and ask for food. Yeah, they th- he, he took spiritual things lightly. And that's what God hated about Esau. He took the things of God lightly. He did not care about the heritage that God had given him as a firstborn. Yeah. He didn't care about the heritage of God. He didn't care about those things. He was more mindful of earthly things. Yes. And that's why the Bible says, Jacob have I loved but Esau, Esau have I hated. So when people tell me God loves everybody, no, he doesn't. There's one he, he hates hated. Esau. There's those whom he loves and those who he hates. He said, I will have mercy on those whom I will have mercy. And those who I will judge, I will judge. You know, so he doesn't treat everybody the same. Yeah. So when God blesses you with something, the only way you're going to keep whatever God has given you is by covenanting it and to God and also your life, your altar, your, your prayer life, your, your dedication to the altar. Because mm. it's that altar that, that gives life to everything that you have. Mm. Without an altar, you're very vulnerable to the enemy. He can take advantage of your marriage. You know, people have advice and all sorts of counsel. But let me tell you, you can give a man 10 children or you can give a woman 10 children you can give somebody everything and then they leave you there with everything that you have done in your strength you will sweat but if you dedicate your marriage if you dedicate everything to god then you will not sweat 
the things that people struggle to get. Ah, I want to get my husband's attention. Let me go for plastic surgery. Let me add this to myself. Let me go and do this. Let me put some this and, and remove some that from myself so that I can appease my husband. When, when you're doing it in your strength, you will sweat. You will do all that and he will go for the house help. You, I'm telling you, you don't have to struggle <laughs> when you have an altar. Everything, your marriage, your wife, your husband, dedicate that relationship to God and tell God, God, please protect my marriage. If you protect my marriage, we shall raise God-fearing children. And when we raise these God-fearing children, we want them to serve you. You know, and in my marriage, because you're blessing me, I will use this marriage to be a blessing to others. Anybody that comes in my house when they are crying, I will make sure that they get out when they are laughing. It's a covenant. Mm. Anybody that comes across me, uh, maybe as a married, I will make sure that I stand with that person because I love you and I want my marriage to stay. So uh, you do this for me, I will do this for you. I, I, I will support the kingdom. When, when it's time to support, when we come across any minister, God, as a covenant, when we come across any minister that needs support, I will speak to my husband, it's a covenant, and I will convince him to support this minister. And he will support your work and your work will continue. And please, if you see that we are in a situation where we can support a minister and you want us to support that, let that minister come to us. Mm -hmm. Create a way and God will do that. And I'm telling you, you will not struggle. Mm -hmm. you, you will not struggle to, to, to keep somebody around you because it's work. How are you going to monitor somebody's phone? How are you going to follow somebody everywhere? How, how, how are you going to do all that, my sister? How strong are you? <laughs> and if okay, even if you find out, how are you going to fight with your man? <laughs> how are you going to how? And even if you are a man and you're strong, how many men are you going to fight to keep your woman? <laughs> how many? Everything is maintained and preserved on the altar. Without the altar, you're finished. Without the altar, you don't have life. Whatever you have doesn't have life. It can go. And anything that doesn't have life is buried. When a person dies, no matter how beautiful and how, how nice looking they were, at a certain point, people will be like, when do we bury this one? Because at a certain point, this person is going to smell. This person is going to start rotting. So before the person starts rotting, let's bury. So you don't have to get there. Your situation doesn't have to get there. And even if it has gotten there, you can get your life back through the altar. Yeah. So we discovered the altar and it has worked for us and we feel you also need to know it. You need to know the truth and the truth that you will know will set you free. You don't have to pay people. You don't have to, to, to carry your hard-earned money and start paying people so that you can, you can get the things that you can get for yourself. God has availed it to everybody. The same thing that Erica can get, you can also get. The same thing that... Uh, Tim can get, you can also get. And it is free. God has given it. He has availed it to us. So why do you have to sweat? Sweat on the altar. You will not sweat before men. Don't sweat on the altar. You will sweat before men. Actually, prayer is, is labor. Yeah. You will labor at that altar. Jesus, God said, by your sweat. So that sweat, that aspect, that principle of sweat, it will never leave. But it's the kind of sweat. You can sweat slaving away for somebody else who has a, an altar that he's servicing, or you can sweat at your own altar. The choice is yours. But it's better if you sweat at your own altar. Everyone who was great in the Old Testament, they always had altars. Everybody. Even yeah. in the New Testament, they always even had altars. Even, even in the New Testament, they become the altar. Amen. But in Genesis chapter 15, he says, after these things, from verse 1, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram. This is before Abram had become Abraham, before God had changed his name. He said, I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. And Abraham said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed. And lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be your heir, 
but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be your heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars, if you be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Now I want you to get that point right there, because when God had promised Abram that he would have a child of his own bowels, it had been 25 years earlier. So this was 25 years after the Lord had already promised him. But God, in order to bring the promise to pass, had to give Abraham something to meditate on, something to think on, something to base his faith on. So he told him to step outside and look into the heavens, to look at the stars and see if you can count them for number. So shall your seed be. So that's why Abraham, or Abraham started going outside every night and looking at the stars and remembering the promise of God. So shall my seed be. If I can count the number of the stars, that's how many my seed will be. And he would tell Sarah to do the same thing. And he began to teach those of his household the meditations, the repeating. The reason why God told him to look at the stars and see if you can count them is so that he can begin that process of meditation. And the Bible is very clear in 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 Genesis uh, even uh, Isaac in Genesis 24, 63, the Bible says and Isaac went out to meditate in the field at the eventide and he lifted up his eyes and saw and behold, the camels were coming. What did Isaac go out there to meditate on? Who taught Isaac to meditate? It was Abraham. It was Abraham, obviously. And then and Abraham learned it from God. To recite, to recycle in your mind the promises of God, to keep it going over and over and over again. Why? Because it will program your spirit, man. And that which programs your spirit is what will show up in your life. People are living lives that are the overflows of their deepest meditations. People live lives that are in line with the things they are meditating on on a regular basis. What is your meditation on a daily basis? That's your life. That is what shows up in your life, and oftentimes those things are trauma. Yeah, like you, you would, you, you could, you could have been traumatized as a child, and Satan makes sure that he traumatizes people, especially sexually, through molestation and things like that. Why? Because he knows that as you grow up through the years, you will often think about, about the trauma that took place, and when you think about it. You're actually meditating on it. You're recollecting. You are, you are actually in the moment when it happened. And it has formed a persona. It, f it forms a, a, a portion of, your ver of the essence of your being. When you repeat it, when you recycle it in your thoughts, you're basically meditating on it. And what happens? You start meeting people who are abusive. That cycle keeps showing up in your life over and over again. That's why Satan enters into people. That's why demons are sent to enter into men and abuse their daughters or abuse their wives or, or, be, you know, or abuse their sons. It, this, especially in Masonic families, fathers are always they're sodomizing their children. children. Why? Why are they doing that? Because Satan knows if I can get the father to sodomize the child, this child will continue in a cycle of abuse that provides tremendous inroads for demons. Yeah. That's why that's why the abuse is so common. So thinking of or meditating on things that are in God's word, memorize, that's why I encourage you, memorize the scriptures because it will, re you only, your mind only has so much memory. I'm going to give an example. So you can replace, you can replace the evil memories with scriptures because yeah. your mind can only have so much storage. So memorize more scripture so that you can replace the wickedness with God's word. And that word will begin to show up in your life. Relating to what you're saying, I'll give an example of my dad because my dad is open to all this. He shares his story. So uh, my brother hated his life when he fell, when... Uh, you know, he shares how witchcraft took over at a certain point before he got delivered. So my dad started now drinking. 
and my brother hated that because he was drinking and we were not financially okay and my mother at that point was providing so my brother hated that and he he became so angry with my dad and he hated my dad little did he know that by thinking about it and meditating on it he's going to end up turning like my dad Mm-hmm. So he he kept on talking about it. How can he be drinking out with his friends? Why as we are struggling to get school fees, we are struggling to get rent, blah blah and he would say I hate you, I hate you and he would say all that but he kept on meditating on it. Mm-hmm. Until one day my brother started drinking. So that he even went beyond my dad and he started taking drugs. So I I I had to tell him you see you hate that you talk all the time you're talking about the bad things that he has done until you're becoming the bad thing itself so you have to forgive daddy you have to release him and then ask god to work in your life because what you're doing is you're becoming even worse than daddy why because you've held him in your heart and you're meditating on the things that daddy has been doing all the time you don't stop talking about it you don't stop and you're not going to hear if you're not careful you'll find yourself even worse than daddy and actually bitterness is a source of disease yes if en- if the enemy can find bitterness in you anger or rage because of something that somebody else did and there's no forgiveness that's the inroads that the enemy will use to make you sick and when he forgave he started praying for daddy and today daddy is preaching with evans they are not drinking anymore <laughs> there is healing there is forgiveness those two work together they walk together you may think they are twins <laughs> they they love each other but the enemy had come in like that and you find you know women who have been abused in their marriages transferring it to their children men are bad Men are not to be trusted. Men are evil. You study hard and avoid men. You know all that. Then the child. Those are doctrines of yes. devils. Yes, and then the, the child gets to forty, and the the mother starts panicking. Please pray for my daughter. She's forty. She has a good job. She's not married. But you made her meditate on the wrong stuff. You know. You tell her, well, my experience was not good, but you don't have to go through this experience. you get married to the right man a god fearing man you start telling her what god says about her life not what you went through and and putting all your burden on a small child so this child will keep meditating on that and even if she gets married she can end up getting married to a man who is just like her dad because that's what she's been meditating on you know men are abusers men are bad men are evil and 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 she she's getting it she's meditating on it when she sits by herself and she's thinking she said mama said men are bad mama said men are not to be trusted mama said men are evil and she's meditating on the wrong stuff so why don't you collect good stuff what god wants your child to hear and train up a child the way they should go so that when they grow they will not depart from those ways but what you're doing is putting the wrong seed i know you were hurt but you have to ask god to help you heal and to forgive you you could have divorced you could have separated from the man but that seed that you're planting in the child has to grow because life is spiritual you're saying those words and the child is getting and she's meditating instead of meditating on the word of god like abraham taught isaac to meditate and isaac was meditating on and uh, uh, you know just like the dad was meditating just like god taught the dad to meditate isaac was also meditating and then his wife came actually isaac became the product of abraham's meditations yes abraham and isaac i mean abraham and sarah started meditating on god's promise and what happened her bowels her womb received life again wow see because the word of god jesus said the words that i speak they are spirit and they are life that means they are both spiritual and physical that means they have dominion over the spirit realm and the physical realm that means that god's word is power 
And if God's word is powerful enough to create the world, then God's word is also powerful enough to create your world. That's why if you are wise, you sacrifice time to meditate in the scriptures. Because as you do so, those words, they start providing the details that describe your life. They start providing the energy that can program your life. Life is programmable, just like software is programmable. Operating systems in your phone, on your computer, it's all programmable. Websites, you can program a website. Your life also can be programmed. Yes. You, it doesn't matter where you're from. You could be from the bottom, the worst slum in the world. The exciting thing about the kingdom of God is that you can start feeding yourself on God's word and meditating on God's promises. And that right there will produce and create and program a future for you that can get you out of that situation. True. That's how we got out. Yeah. And that's how I prescribe everybody to get out. Mm -hmm. This is the most central important principle in the entire kingdom of God. This principle is so important that if you don't apply it, Jesus asks, well, if you don't know, if you don't know this principle, then what principle do you know? And, and when you say life is programmable, the world knows it. That's why in cartoons, they are putting homosexuality programs because they want to program your children. In music, they have to pass messages to program your life. A person will be singing, you give me heart attack, you turn me upside down, and you're singing, but they are programming. Mm. They are programming you, and, and you, you think it's just entertainment. It's not entertainment. It's not innocent. They know it, and they don't want you to know it. Mm. But when you know it, you're set free because you don't become their victim. So you're so conscious on what content you feed yourself on. Yes, because you understand the principle that whatever enters in through the eye gate, there's three gates, remember? The eye gate, the ear gate, and the, the mouth. mouth gate because you hear whatever you say. So you're conscious of what you allow to enter in, into your heart because whatever is repeated to you over and over and over again. People in the slum, uh, many times they never come out and we were there. Yeah. They never come out. Why? Because when they look outside, that's all they see. When they hear the conversations, they hear the conversations of poverty. And those conversations are repeated. How many times did you grow up hearing there's no money? Or did you grow up hearing maybe your parents saying, do you think money grows on trees? They start saying that, the, <laughs> yeah, they, that there's no money. That you, you always hear that. I don't have it. Do you think I get money for free? You think I pluck money from trees? We don't have it. The family's blah, blah, blah. They, every, every word that they gave you that had nothing to do with abundance, those words possibly entered into your heart. Now you can tell what has been programmed into your spirit, man, by your experience. What are you experiencing right now? The life you are living today is a direct reflection of your meditations that entered into your heart yesterday. And the life you will live tomorrow is a direct result of the meditations that you have programmed your spirit man with today. So a wise man separates time daily just to enter into the scriptures and program his spirit with the right stuff so that the right stuff can show up in his life. You know, Jesus said, a good man out of the good treasures of the heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasures of the heart brings forth evil things. Life can go either way, depending on what you feed yourself with. You feed yourself with good quality, you have a good quality life. You feed yourself with garbage, you have a garbage life. True. And that's the exciting thing about the kingdom of God. Your life can change. But people oftentimes will come looking for the man of God. Please pray for me. Yeah, we'll definitely pray for you. However, what will change your life is not my prayers. Mm -hmm. What will change your life is your service to that altar, your consistency therein, your mm -hmm. obedience. To obey is better than sacrifice yeah. and to hearken than the fat of lambs. So, to keep God's word. He said, thou shalt meditate there in day and night. That's a minimum of two or twice a day. You should be meditating God's word minimum twice a day. And that will fill your spirit, man, with the right stuff. It's like if you if you got sick, you go to a hospital. They say, take one of these pills in the morning and take another pill in the evening for the next two weeks. When you go home and you only take it once in the morning and sometimes you forget, then on the third day, you take one in the evening. 
but then you forgot to take it in the morning. Will your situation improve? No. No way. And a lot of people are in sick situations. And the remedy is Joshua 1.8. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night. That's the prescription. So that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then you will make your way prosperous. And then you will have good success so there's a prescription there's a definite prescription for your success without these things you live a life of being a victim of somebody else's altar and you don't want that yeah. in mark 4 the parable of the kingdom is the most important powerful parable in the whole bible as far as the kingdom of god is concerned remember everything we preach is kingdom yeah. inside this kingdom there's an altar he said, and he began to teach by the seaside and there was gathered unto him a great multitude so that he entered into a ship and sat in the sea and the whole multitude was by the sea on the land. So the boat, the, the front of the boat was the pulpit and the sea was the congregation. I mean, the land was the congregation and he taught them many things by parables and he said unto them in his doctrine, remember what I told you, he's he speaks in parables so that those who are hungry for God can press in and those who are not hungry for God can get out. And he speaks like that and he wants that because what he wants, he, he, oh, the Lord is so wise. It's a filtration process. He's filtering those who are his from those who are not. So it's not about numbers. That's why I look at churches that that are, you know, doing what the world is doing just so that they can get more numbers. He, he's, God is not looking for quantity. He doesn't care about that. He wants quality because he can turn a stone into a human being. So it's not a, the, your numbers, are, those are, that's not a big deal. He told Gideon, you have too many people. Reduce. I'll, I'll, I'll give you this army. I'll give you the Midianites with less people. Get rid of some. It's not about quantity for him. So he said in verse 3, Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow, and it came to pass as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. Some fell on stony ground. So the wayside, that's the first kind of Christian. Some fell by the wayside, the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. That's Christian number one, he fails. Some fell on stony ground, where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up. And because it had no depth of earth, but when the sun was up, it was scorched. And because it had no root, it withered away. That's failure number two. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. It's failure number three. And other fell on good ground and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased and brought forth some 30, some 60, some 100 folk. So it's the fourth kind. So even of those who are gathered in the church, one out of four gets it right. Yeah. One out of four. Now you can go from being the one who fell by the wayside to being the one who is among thorns to being the one who's um, among stony ground and then being the one and becoming the one through desire. You can become the one that is fruitful ground. But he gives the explanation as to why he spoke, speaks in parables and what it means, what the parable meant in verse 10. And when he was alone, they that were about him with the twelve asked of him the parable. And he said unto them, unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. This is what he calls this parable. He calls it the mystery of the kingdom of God. You see how important this thing is? But unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. You see, it's a, it's a filtering system. You, the whole Bible is a parable too. It's a story, right? It's a filtering system. If God wanted to just suddenly win the whole world, he could just sim simply appear. Everybody would repent instantly. But why does he send us to go preach the gospel? It's because it's a filtration system. Whoever hears the story of Jesus Christ and feels cut to the heart and repents, those one truly belong to God. <laughs> but whoever doesn't does not repent. And, and nobody wants to marry a gold digger. Everybody wants, every man 
who is wealthy wants to marry a genuine wife. You don't want a knife. You want a wife. You don't want a mouse. You want a spouse. <laughs> <laughs> so he said unto them, know ye not this parable? How then will you know all parables? So Jesus makes this parable the most important parable. The sower sows the word, the preacher under the influence of the spirit of God gives you the scriptures, gives you, gives you the principles. And these are they by the wayside. Remember the first kind that failed? These are they by the wayside. So these are wayside Christians, wayside Christians where the word is sown. But when they have heard Satan comes immediately and takes the word that was sown in their heart. So Satan comes and steals that word that was sown in their heart. So I can I can give you the principle, but as soon as the video is over, Satan is coming for that principle that I just gave you. And he's coming to steal it. Man, you ain't got time. You don't have time to be meditating in scriptures. Man, that stuff doesn't work, man. These preachers are liars, etc., etc., etc. Then comes the thief to steal. Satan comes immediately. So right after the video, expect the enemy to try, to to try and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. That's failure number one. Number two, and these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground. Who, when they have heard the word, immediately they receive it with gladness. So they're at church, they're the pastor is preaching, and they're like, Preach Amen, it, preach it, man of God, preach it. I receive. I receive. Yeah. Prophesy. Immediately receive it. <laughs> Prophesy. Emeritus. Imme <laughs> immediately receive it with gladness. But watch this, verse 17, and have no root in themselves. And so endure, but for a time. You see what happens? Afterwards, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. So how come they have no root in themselves? It means that when they left church, they went back home, tossed the Bible on the dresser or on the bed, go to the living room, turn on the TV, kick up your feet, enjoy the game. I've been to church. I've fulfilled my quota. Now let me do what I really enjoy, which is watching movies, which is trading my time for things that do not really have value, eternal relevance, have no root in themselves. And so because you spent no time in the scriptures, Spend no time praying and in meditation therein day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein for then you'll make your way prosperous and then you'll have good success because you had no time. You had no root in yourself. You endure but for a time. Remember, if you see a cedar tree, cedar tree is one of the tallest trees, the cedars of Lebanon. They're some of the tallest trees in the world. They grow up to 120 feet. But if you look at the root, it goes down 300 feet. So the wind can blow upon it. But no matter how much the wind blows, the cedar tree is rooted. Right. So you must be rooted in the word. He said they have no root in themselves and so endure for a time. Afterward, when the enemy sends affliction, when the enemy sends the storms of life or the winds of change and persecution arises for the word's sake, when the boss says, sleep with me or I fire you. And they say, man, I would rather just go ahead and sleep with him at least just this, maybe this one time and I at least I won't get kicked out of my house. When persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they're offended and they lose. Verse 18, so that's the second kind. And the third kind that lost is right here. These are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word and the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the lusts of other things entering in, choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. That's the third kind. So as soon as the word was sown into your spirit, you were told that there's another system. You don't have to be a slave yeah. of the financial system. You don't have to be a slave of of Satan's kingdom of was, darkness. Now, as soon as as soon as you're told these things, Satan comes with an offer. You see what it said? The lust of other things entering in. So Satan, the the kingdom of darkness. They're not even Satan himself. He's too senior. There's others, smaller principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spirits. They program events to offer you a situation. Yes. But that situation requires compromise of your integrity mm -hmm. to draw you away. And what did he say? These are they which are sown. Uh, these are they, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the lusts of other things entering in. 
Where did they enter in? To your heart, into your garden. And what did they do? They choked the word and it became unfruitful. But the fourth kind is the kind that we are hoping and praying that we're speaking to. You might have been any of the other three kinds, but you can transform into the fourth kind. You must press in. I won't even, I won't lie to you to say that 100% of you are going to make it. That's a lie. But I will say this, 100% of you that will put 100% dedication will make it. Yeah. Definitely. And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word, receive it, are rooted in it. Meditate therein day and night. Commit to it. Live by it. Make it the center of their existence. And they are good ground. And they hear the word. They receive it. They bring forth fruit. Some 30-fold, some 60-fold, and some 100. Now, Jesus says in that same chapter, he says, If any man has ears to hear, let him hear. In other words, whenever Jesus says that, he said it twice in this chapter. Whenever Jesus says, he that has ears, let him hear. If you can, if you can perceive, if you can possibly understand this thing, understand this thing. This thing can save you. Because without this, you will remain in a, in a, in a position of desperation for extended period of time. Beyond what God had planned for you. Now, desperate people do desperate things. Yeah. So, you might have been strong like last year. But if you are still desperate two, three years from now because you failed to apply the principles of the word of God, you'll find yourself being tempted with something that perhaps was a little too much. And by that, people fall. And whenever you fall, a prince took your throne. I told you, this is a game of thrones. And when you pass an exam, you're promoted. Yes. And when you fail, you're demoted. You're demoted. So why you're staying in that condition? I'm not saying that as Christians, we don't suffer, we don't go through pain. Yeah, but it's not supposed to be prolonged. Mm -hmm. So when you see yourself repeating the exam and repeating it and repeating it, then there's something that you need to do. You know, it's something that you have not done right. You have failed that exam. Strengthen your convictions. Have yes. root in yourself. He said they had no root in themselves. So you strengthen your convictions so that when the temptation comes the next time, Pass. whatever the consequence is, the fall, that's the, you were supposed to, <laughs> you were supposed to fall in that situation. You were supposed to be fired. If, if the offer was sleep with me or you lose your job, you're supposed to lose the job. That's when you lose the job. It looks like misfortune, but really that's the promotion. To the world, it looks like demotion. But to the kingdom of God, that was your promotion. In fact, if you're promoted in that job as a result of sleeping with the boss, in the kingdom of God, you were demoted. But in the kingdom of darkness, you were promoted. <laughs> and you have to keep that job by sleeping with him. You, yeah, and when because he doesn't want to sleep with you anymore and he wants to sleep with someone else, you'll be fired. You'll be fired and replaced. He said, yeah. because you see, what you compromise to obtain, you must compromise to maintain. maintain. So if you cannot maintain it, don't try to obtain it. Yes. So and these things are in the word of God and they're hidden there. You should, you should be able to read the parable and then extract the principle and write it and live by it. Yeah. So... And when I got saved, I really wanted to know how to survive as a Christian because I knew how to survive in the world and I knew how to keep those altars and covenants the worldly way, you know, and I, I had lived a life where I was powerful. So I wanted to be powerful also in the kingdom of God and to to have a, a, a reasonable life, you know. Mm. So it, it, it took a while. For me to grasp this, I, 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 I struggled. I went through, you know, failing exam, passing exam, you know, how it is when you are newly saved. But because I was committed and I really wanted it, God gave it to me. He gave me that knowledge. But through different situations and circumstances, I would fail some exams and repeat and repeat the cycle until I would get it right. Mm -hmm. Even you, I know you went through the same cycle of, of falling an exam and then you find yourself in that situation and the situation getting prolonged. And then when you do it right, you're mm -hmm. like, wow, this is all I needed to do. Mm -hmm. and you learn, you learn, you, you gain an experiential knowledge. Yeah, so we are telling life. you this from experience. From experience and from the word of God.
God yeah. so as to save you some time because you don't have all day. And the principle of time conversion is a principle that can make you great because yeah. you trade your time for that which makes you great as opposed to trading it for just mere entertainment or yeah. you know foolishness. So the servicing of your altar is a big deal. And you'll learn as you continue to learn how to hear from God. Learn how even situations can be God speaking. And learn how to hear, how to do business with a, vis with a spirit that is invisible. But he's holy. Yeah. And you learn when he's upset at a situation. You learn him. You get the hang of it. This is a skill that you will learn. It's like, you know, any other skill, like riding a bike. Any, anything that is worth having is a skill worth spending time acquiring. I so have, God is worth it. I had a, a, a Nollywood actress sharing his experience. He was based in the U.S. And then he decided to go to Nigeria to, to venture into film production. But this guy had not mastered the, the, the secret of having an altar. So he went with his money. And <laughs> he made mega losses. And he went back to square zero. And he lost his wife, his family, everything, and money, you know. And then I, I listened to another, a Nollywood act, act, actor who started with little money. And then his, his uh, career went big. But he said something. Before he goes to act, he has to meditate. He separates himself, you know. He's mm. talking about spiritual things. This one is talking about strength. He's talking about, I came with my money. Doing it uh, big. Some, some thousand dollars. Big whatever shot. dollars it ah. is. And he's, he's, he's relying on his strength. And he lost everything. Because <laughs> he didn't know what he was going for. In the industry, there's competition. And these people in the industry have grasped the, the secret of the altar. So you, you're just going with your money. <laughs> you end up losing everything, you know, and then getting disappointed. So this man, should he know the concept that no, I do, there's something that is more than money that I need you know, to be able to, because he's a very talented man. He's a very talented man. When you see some of the movies he has acted, he's very talented. But where he's missing is the, the source. Him, he's relying on his own strength. And there, he, if you get out of the presence of God, you sweat. If you don't sweat in the presence of God, you will sweat before men. And you will make losses. And, and, and men will laugh and men will talk. But if you sweat in the presence of God, he will, he will grace you. He will cover you with his glory. He will make life smooth for you. He will prepare a table for you in the presence of your enemies. God can rearrange your life. He can introduce you before great men. He can introduce you before kings. You don't need to work so hard for people great men to know you. God can just do one thing like this and the king will not sleep that night. He will be just thinking about how he can reward you and your enemy will tell him how best he can reward you like Mordecai. Mm -hmm. you know? So the altar is a place where the two dimensions come together. Remember? Yeah. The altar is the junction between the physical world and the spiritual, spiritual. world. And remember... We told you that these two worlds exist parallel to each other. Yeah. Just outside of human perception, there's a veil. And then there's another world. But it's right here. Yet, it's like, like the example we gave previously. A television. You can flip through the channels. This is channel 3. Go to channel 4. The same frame. Mm. Different channel. So, and the spirit world. Programs. Mm -hmm, different programs. So, the spirit world is just the next channel. And that's why oftentimes one who communicates with the spirit realm and can convey whatever the spirit is saying in the physical world is called a channeler or a medium. Medium between the two. That's why medium is one. Media is plural. So what the media does is gives you the voices, gives you the, the it's a conveyor of information. Basically, so the altar is that junction, the central point between the two dimensions. All right. Now, in the kingdom of God, when we offer a sacrifice on the altar, it is received in the altar of heaven. Before the throne of God, there is an altar there. So 
you offer it here, but it is received in heaven. But in the kingdom of darkness, when they offer their sacrifices, God does not receive those altars. That means that their sacrifices are offered here on the surface, but they are received in, 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 the, in the lower kingdoms, in the kingdom of darkness. So one is received in heaven, that's the kingdom of God. The other is received in darkness, that's the kingdom of the devil or the kingdom of darkness. Now, what you offer on that altar is your offering, obviously, but that is from earth to the spirit. What they respond with, what the spirit realm responds with comes from the spirit realm into the physical. That's the exchange. That's the power. Now, when Cain killed his brother Abel, the blood spilled to the ground. What Cain did not realize was that that was a sacrifice. Yes. But of course, God did not receive that sacrifice. That was a sacrifice to the devil. Mm -hmm. So that place where the blood came to the ground, the altar began speaking immediately because yes. it's the blood and yeah. the blood speaks. Now, obviously, Cain did not know that the blood can testify. In a court of law, there are usually those who give testimony, yeah. witnesses. Cain had not taken into account that blood itself can also be a witness and testify. Even the ground can be a witness and testify. The place where that blood spilled became an altar right there, and it began to testify and to testify against Cain. So the sacrifice that went into the ground was the blood of Abel. But the response that came from the spirit realm was the judgment of God. And he said upon, he said, he said, cursed are thou from the earth. You know, the, the earth shall not yield of its strength unto thee. A vagabond shall you be, etc., etc. So that was the response of God that came, that, that, that was a, a direct result of his actions. So you can see now the relationship between the physical and the spirit realm. Yeah. You can see how an offering is being made and a response comes immediately. An offering is being made and a response comes. And this is all through the scriptures. You're talking about the mediums. I remembered my grandmother. Uh, when people would come to the shrine, they would sing certain songs to please the spirits. And then when the spirits are transported, because music is transport, it transports a spirit depending on uh, you know the source you know so like David he would transport the spirit of God through his music while he's playing the harp and and Saul would get delivered now uh, there are some songs that are dedicated to altars whenever a person is singing or listening to them they are transporting spirits so my grandmother would transport spirits through those sounds yeah, so she would, they would sing like songs uh, talking about the, the spirits that uh, possess children, come and possess me, you, you possessed me when I was young, I'll never forget you, mm -hmm. songs like that. And when she's singing, uh, the, the, that music, the, 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 it, it would get to a point when my grandmother would get possessed. And mm. how I would know that she's possessed, the eyes would roll and become white. She was also a medium. She was a medium. And then uh, after that, her voice changes and the voices of the spirits start speaking and telling the clients what they want to do. I am, mm. I am spirit so-and-so. I want you to sacrifice this God on a mm. certain day. And this God should be this, 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 this. I want you to sacrifice a chicken on this day. And this will be this. And I want you to, to go and get this herb and get this and mix it with this. And now you will get a solution to your problem. You know? And, and, and the, they, 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 my auntie who was attending to my grandmother would grasp everything that the Spirit has spoken. And then they would instruct their client to do that. And the client would come to the altar and sacrifice the goat, sacrifice the chicken, and do whatever the spirits have instructed him to do. And then now the altar would speak for him, and he would get whatever he has come to get. Mm -hmm. uh, if, it is, if the person was barren and they want a child, they say you are going to have a son, and you have to bring this son for this ritual after this period of time. You know, mm -hmm. oh, you have to come here and I will be your birth attendant and we will dedicate the son, this son to the spirits if you want him to, to stay alive, mm. you know. So the, she, she was doing all that. And now when you spoke about the mediums, that's when 
all this dawned into my mind. I was like, wow. So she was also a medium. She was not only a sorcerer. She mm-hmm. was also a medium because she was she was doing the things and she was she knew how to transport spirits, how mm-hmm. to you know to get spirit because spirits look for for vessels. If a spirit is speaking on its own, you cannot hear. Mm-hmm. unless your spiritual ears are alert so they need a vessel so my grandmother would avail herself as a vessel and mm-hmm. then start singing songs to honor and to transport the spirits and then exactly. the spirits would tap into her and channel into her and speak through her mm, exactly because a human being is a vessel a hu- human beings were created to be vessels yeah. all right man was created to carry the presence of God mm-hmm. and to convey that presence into this dimension called the earth. Now, Jeremiah chapter 10 says, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. Yeah. It is not in man that walks to direct his steps. In other words, a human being does not just live based on his own decisions because there are forces, there are powers that be that are greater than him. And those powers can program events into his life that are far beyond his own ability to manipulate. Like, you can start a business, sure, you can choose to do business, but a COVID-19 situation can come and shut down all of the businesses. So, it is not in man that walks to direct his steps. Or, by the same token, you could have your business if God instructed you to do it, and you're living by the principles of the Word of God and your altar is strong. So during the time that COVID-19 comes, instead instead of your business collapsing, that's when your business actually rises up and increases in business. It all depends, though, on what spirit is living in you and, and, and being conveyed through you. Now, in Judges 6, we get a glimpse of the power of the altars. Judges chapter 6, verse 23. And the Lord said unto him, he was speaking to Gideon, Peace be unto thee, fear not. You shall not die. Then Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord and called it Jehovah Shalom, meaning God, my God is peace. Our God is peace. Unto this day it is yet in Ophrah of the Abiezrites. And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Take your father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old, and throw down the altar of Baal, and your father that your father has and cut down the grove that is by it a grove is just a tree or a group of trees a garden of trees cut down the grove that is by it and build an altar unto the lord thy god upon the top of this rock in the ordered place and take the second bullock and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the grove which thou shalt cut down Then Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had said unto him. And so it was, because he feared his father's household and the men of the city, that he could not do it by day, that he did it by night. So you see, God is giving him instructions. Cut down the altar of Baal. Cut down the grove, the bushes or the the garden of trees um, that your, 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 your father had. Have you ever heard of the Bohemian Grove? It was, it's a it's a grove it's a it's it's a it's a forest basically okay but in that place powerful men presidents they, go there they went for... there and they were yeah and they were having seances rituals yeah. things like okay. that yeah. mm-hmm. so it's a place where they interact it's, it's an altar it's a place where they interact with spirits yes but now god was telling gideon to cut down that grove and destroy the altar of baal and replace it with an altar unto the Lord and offer upon that altar the second bullock, offer burnt sacrifice with the wood of the grove which you will cut down. So he told him to cut down the wood from that grove and place it upon the altar of the Lord. And there, that same place where he had cut down the, the altar of Baal, he replaced it with a nut with an altar unto the Lord. So this is a major key here. Wherever you see a cycle of infirmity, misfortune, limitation, uh, rejection, what have you in your life. There is an altar at work, especially when you know this person is hardworking, this person is committed, this person is disciplined, but things never work out for them. Things keep on falling down. Nothing can succeed. There's an altar at work and it's speaking and the covenant is still alive. So 
Number one, you must tear down that altar. Number two, you must rear another altar unto the Lord because it's altar versus altar. So you must tear down that altar. You must build one unto the Lord. And on that altar, you offer a sacrifice, which is a definite consecration. So not only will you offer some kind of a sacrifice, but you'll say, Lord, upon this altar, I offer that every day from 12 to 1 a.m., I will pray one hour or two hours or every day I will not eat until 6 p.m. according to the covenant of the altar that I have with you. And you understand you're starting to do business with a spirit now. And the more you do business with God, the more realer God becomes to you than the, the people who are walking around you. You know this, this covenant is real. If I break my side of the covenant, all hell can break loose. So now you, you have become a priest you are a priest of the altar. The same thing we did uh, where my grandmother had planted a shrine, planted a church. Mm. And we are seeing changes. We are seeing the place developing. Exactly. We are people's lives changing. Mm. And then when I look at the, the Elijah, Elijah and the prophets of Baal contest, mm. uh, they, they built their altar and Elijah built an altar to the Lord. And Elijah kept on mocking them and he was like, has your God slept? Call him some more. Maybe he'll wake up. Maybe your God has gone somewhere, you know. But you look at what the prophets of Baal did. They cut themselves. They did all sorts of things to call their God. But their God could not come because where there is an altar of God, the altar of darkness, light and darkness cannot be in the same place. Where there is light, darkness has to go. But when you look at how dedicated these people were to the point of cutting themselves, mm. you can see, you know. So uh, it, it, we, we really learn from the Bible, from, from these uh, experiences that the men of God had to go through. And then we, we, we also apply it to our day-to-day -day lives. Like when we applied it, we, we started, those people were so poor. Those of you who have been watching the foundation, the World Share Foundation, uh, uh, we started helping those people. The poverty there, but now when we see how God is transforming that village from the time we cut that altar and mm. planted an altar unto the Lord, and there is a church there, we shall go back and show you. People are developing, people are beginning to build houses, uh, mm -hmm. People's children are beginning to graduate. There is one who testified she got married. She got married to a Kenyan. So she was like, I got married to a Kenyan like Erica. <laughs> so you can see uh, like uh, people's lives, you know, she's deaf. But God blessed her with a good husband and caring. So they did, they did a good wedding. There were no weddings in that village. Mm. No weddings. Uh, people, people would like anybody who gets a breakthrough would run away from the village because they, they were scared. They know, yeah. Uh, there's a spirit. There's altars that work there that keep people in wretched poverty. Yeah. Now, as soon as Gideon tore down the grove, used the wood, and put it on the altar of the Lord, and offered the sacrifice of a bullock that was seven years old, according to the instruction that the Lord gave him. He took a small number of men and defeated the Midianites who had enslaved the children of Israel for years. The Midianites used to come through and harvest and burn down the children of Israel's harvest. The entire harvest, you, like your whole family would starve to death. Your whole, your people would starve to, because of the Midianites. They had held them in, in captivity, in slavery, now, in Ronya subjugation. Had them the same way. Yeah. She, it rains only in her garden. And mm. in everybody's garden, it's dry, meaning they don't have food. Mm. And if they stole from Adronia, she would enslave them. She would cause people to farm in her garden at night. By the time they wake up in the morning, they are so tired, they cannot mm. go to their gardens. So that is the kind of enslavement that the enemy gives. When there is a satanic altar, there is oppression in the land. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this thing is all over the world. If you are not serving the altar of the Lord, you're serving somebody else's altar. Yes. Like, just, I mean, just in your normal life, and you might not even consider that it was an altar, like a prostitute. She serves Jezebel. She doesn't know that she's serving Jezebel. She doesn't know that every time she sleeps with a customer, she's renewing the covenant that she has with Jezebel. Jezebel. And Jezebel pays her a certain amount of money. 
And that's the renewal of the covenant. And the cycle continues and continues and continues. And she doesn't know that there are curses coming upon her life because she's breaking homes. She's mm. uh, maybe infecting people. Mm. And she's uh, stealing people's destinies. And look, the more she destroys homes and causes heartache and divorces and destruction in society the more pain those family members feel. Yeah. And the more pain those family members feel, the stronger Jezebel becomes. So the kingdom of darkness feeds on our misery, our sadness, our grief, and our pains. That's the substance that they feed on. That's why they need to create more pain, more hatred, more jealousy, more envy, more strife, more grief, more death. Why? Because it provides the energy that the kingdom of darkness needs to feed on. That's why the wars, like we were showing you, the, the symbols on the dollar bill, that's an altar with a pyramid. On the other side, you see the this bird that's looking to the left. You, you see that that's a bird, um, that's the same uh, bird called Horus that the Egyptians worshipped with the sun disk over its head. That's Horus. Horus is the god of war. Horus is the spirit of Antichrist, and that is sun worship. That, that sun god demands sacrifice, and that sacrifice is massive amounts of bloodshed. And as these people die, they suffer grief. And as they suffer grief and hardship, because what Satan will do is he'll use a witch to send curses at the breadwinner of a family and now the breadwinner dies and the family plunges into poverty and the grief and the suffering and the depression that comes as a result strengthens the witch. She grows stronger and stronger. So you see it's a tug of war in this life. It's, it's, it's suffering on one side where people are caused to suffer and, and witches are growing stronger. But then again, on the other side, that's why we're told to bless the poor. We're told to give to the poor. The church should be giving to the poor big time on a, on a very major level. Why? He that gives to the poor lends unto the Lord. You have alleviated somebody's suffering. When you alleviate the suffering of this person, the kingdom of darkness is losing strength. You see, and the kingdom of God is gaining in strength. And that's why as you give to the poor, this person has the, the suffering reduced and you are automatically made stronger. And you'll see that everything you're giving to this person that's poor, become uh, it comes back. And in Proverbs 14, 31, he says, He that despises the poor reproaches his creator, but he that honors him has mercy on the poor. So no church will teach you this, that when you give to the poor, you're honoring God, that when you give to the poor, you're lending to God. And then they'll also, never give you those advantages, and they'll never show you like Psalms chapter uh 41 sorry I, I didn't mean to uh interrupt but he said he said blessed is he that considers the poor one the lord will deliver him out in time of trouble the lord will deliver him in time of trouble two the lord will preserve him three and keep him alive four he shall be blessed upon the earth five you will not deliver him unto the will of his enemies Six, the Lord will strengthen him upon the bed of languishing. Seven, the Lord will make all his bed in his sickness. That's Psalms chapter 41 from verse 1 to verse 3. So, giving as giving to the poor is, the, is one of the most potent strategies for the kingdom disciple in the kingdom of God. It's one of the most powerful strategies. So, when these things are not being taught in the church and instead other forms, this, this is one of the forms of your sacrifice. When you're sacrificed, when you're offering your sacrifice, you're saying, I will alleviate the suffering of this many people, Lord. If you will strengthen me, I will make myself a conduit through which the suffering of those who are helpless is reduced. The Lord will hear that prayer. Yeah. 
and when you're doing it be led by the spirit of god mm-hmm. because there are people who also take advantage just people who abuse it was kindness yeah mm-hmm. they'll so, come you help them one time they'll come back demanding that you help them again and again and again yeah. they'll turn you into their atm but have wisdom expect it and just have wisdom help somebody else you can help another person the next time and another person and another person Look what God says in Psalms 82. He says, God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. Verse 2, how long will you judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? Meaning, how long will you accept a wicked system and participate in a wicked system of selfishness where it is one man gets extremely wealthy at the expense of the many? How long will you participate in this foolishness? In verse 3, defend the poor and fatherless. Those are the instructions. Defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. Those are his direct instructions. So we should be ongoing in in strategies and schemes of poverty alleviation, suffering alleviation, delivering the poor and needy, defending the poor and fatherless, doing justice to the afflicted and needy. This should be our continuous and perpetual campaign. Why? Because we know the power of relieving, reduce the amount of suffering in the earth. What happens? The kingdom of darkness is losing power and the kingdom of God is increasing in power. Now, when you fail to do this, the Lord begins to lament. He speaks with sadness in the fifth verse of Psalms 82. He says, they know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. He says, all the foundations of the earth are out of course. In other words, this issue is foundational. And if you don't do it, it means that the foundations of the earth concerning you are out of course. Verse 6, he said, I have said you are God's. And all of you are children of the Most High, and he's speaking to you and me. In fact, even Jesus repeated it, and he was speaking to the Pharisees. He was speaking to the scribes and the Pharisees, the lawmakers. He was saying, I have said ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. He said, he said and the scripture cannot be broken. And he was speaking to men, and he was quoting, Jesus was quoting Psalms 82, verse 6. I have said you are gods, all of you are children of the Most High. Verse 7, but you will die like men and fall like one of the princes. That means that if you will not apply this principle, if you will not live by the sacrifices on the altar, honoring the Lord in the way prescribed, then what will happen? You die like a man. Things begin to die in your life. You know, everything that, that flourishes in your life or everything that can flourish must be alive. If it's your finances, they must be alive. Even if marriage, it's your relationship, it must be family, alive. Everything is a garden. Business. Everything, it's a garden. Your life is a garden. Your spirit man is where that garden is located. The seed is the word of God. Your situation is the direct result of what you've been sowing in that garden. Yeah. Now, your garden, your desert can become a fruitful garden depending on what you sow in it. Yeah. think... This topic is a wide topic. It's a, it's a wide topic. We'll still come back and, and share as the Spirit leads. But we are so grateful to God and uh, for, for, for the fact that he has brought us and the lessons that he's teaching us. Because every day we learn. Mm-hmm. Life is a, is a school. We keep learning and learning. And those who have knowledge will get it. And as you get in the Word of God, you grow. You grow. The more you read, the more you grow. Yeah, so we just thank you for, 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 for your time, for liking, for subscribing, for sharing, because we want this me- message to go to as many people as possible. So uh, we want to also give those that have not given their lives to Jesus mm. an opportunity, because it doesn't make sense for us to share our experience and this w- testimony and, and the wonderful word of God and just leave you to go to hell. Yeah, yeah so. even if you prosper in this life, even if you're healed, even if you're delivered, even if the demon is cast out, if you end up in hell, it was all for nothing. Yeah. So if you would like to receive the Lord Jesus or rededicate your life to the Lord and had backslidden, Please pray this prayer with me. Say, Father, in the name of Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus. I have heard your word. I've heard your word. I know that Jesus died for my sins. I know that Jesus died for my sins. On the altar of Calvary. On the altar of Calvary. 
I repent. I repent every sin, for every sin that I've ever committed. That I've ever committed. I repent, I repent for the sins of my bloodline. For the sins of my bloodline. Tracing all the way back. Tracing all the way back to Adam and Eve. To Adam and Eve. Please blot out our transgressions. Please blot out our transgressions. I denounce those covenants. I denounce those covenants. I renounce those altars. I renounce those altars. And please bind those spirits. And please bind those spirits that are sent to enforce those altars. That are sent to enforce those altars. And those covenants. And those covenants. I now belong. I now belong to the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. Write my name in the book of life. Write my name in the book of life. Let the altar of Calvary speak for me. Let the altar of Calvary speak for me. Let the altars of Abraham speak for me. Let the altars of Abraham speak for me. Let your word come to pass in my life. Let your word come to pass in my life. Let your word program my future. Let your word program my future. Show me a church where I can be baptized. Show me a church where I can be baptized and receive the Holy Spirit. And receive the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. With the evidence of speaking in tongues. And give me good friends. And give me good friends who can mentor me. Who can mentor me in the school of the Spirit. In the school of the Spirit that I may be strong in the Lord. I may be strong in the Lord and put a smile on your face. And put a smile on your face, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. For it is in your name I pray. For it is in your, your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let me pray for people. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for those that are under the influence of altars. They've been suffering rejection and suffering misfortunes, sicknesses, diseases. There are many who, at a certain age, the family members start dying. There are others that they cannot get married. There are others that they cannot stay married. There are others that they cannot bring a child to term. There are others who cannot get a job. And if they get a job, they can't keep the job. There are others whose businesses keep on collapsing. There are altars speaking in their life. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, we crush those altars. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. We send the word of the Lord according to that same word that the Lord gave to Gideon. We crush the altars of Baal. We crush the altars of the kingdom of darkness. We crush the altars of Jezebel. We speak to those altars and we silence them. We command them to keep silent concerning the children of God. The heritage we have is a heritage of righteousness from Jesus Christ. Therefore, those altars no longer have a right to speak over our lives. We silence those altars. We silence and bind the spirits that come to enforce the covenants of those altars in the name of Jesus. We speak the blood of Jesus against those altars, which is greater than any sacrifice that might have been made at those altars. And mighty father, if we sinned and made it possible for those altars to have access into our life, we repent for those sins right now. And we name those sins, whatever that sin is, you can name it right now. Just name it. Whatever that sin is, we name the sin and we repent repent for those sins we plead the blood of jesus and we pray father that you would protect us that you would preserve us that you would forgive us and may may the blood of jesus blot out the ordinance blot out rejection blot out untimely uh pregnancy blot out divorce blot out untimely death we blot out poverty we blot out rejection we blot out misfortune We blot out sickness and disease. We blot out lust. We blot out addiction to pornography and masturbation. We blot out the covenants that were made between those under the sound of my voice and spirits. They were slaves before, but they're no longer slaves to sin. They are the children of God. So we send the power of God that flows through Calvary, the power of God that flows through our prayer altars as life is spiritual. We send power from our prayer altars, from the God whose altar we service daily. May the power of God set captives free, heal the sick, raise up the lame, give sight to the blind, open deaf ears. May they Pop open in the name of the Lord Jesus. May the tongue that was dumb be loosed. May even the dead be raised. May the power flow through the altar in the name of Jesus. May rejection be destroyed. May he that was jobless now find employment. 
in the line with his fulfillment of purpose in life. May he whose business or she whose business was failing, may it be revived in the name of Jesus. May prayer lives be revived. May healing take place. May recovery take place. May all that was lost be recovered. The thief, if he be found, must restore sevenfold. Yea, he must bring all the goods of his house. We speak recovery of that which was lost. In the name of Jesus, we cast out devils. We cast out every evil spirit that was sent to enforce demonic altars and covenants. We cast out every form of witchcraft. Whether it was buried in the ground, we dig it up. We send fire to dig it up. We send fire to destroy charms, talismans. We send fire to destroy and blot out every word that was spoken at any incantation during any ritual of witchcraft and sorcery. We blot out those words. We silence those words. We condemn those words. The word said, no weapon fashioned against you shall prosper. So every weapon that was fashioned, it shall not prosper. Every tongue that rose up to speak words of curses, we condemn those words. This is the heritage. Now, this is the heritage of them that fear the Lord. This is the heritage that have received righteousness from the Lord. He said, their righteousness is of me, says the Lord. And now because we have the Lord's righteousness, we are glowing, radiant above the brightness of the noonday sun. And with that knowledge, with that eternal life, and with that power, we destroy every form of darkness from your lives. Yes, we pronounce you free. We declare you free. And may the altars of the Lord be established. I pray, mighty Father, that they will enter into covenants with you and do business with you in deep waters. That they'll do business with you at the altar and keep their consecrations with a discipline that is found in your word. Yes, sir. We pray that the blood of Jesus may speak over them. We pray that every answer to prayer that they've been praying concerning, may that answer just fall on them. May it begin to just fall. May it just begin to meet them at the point of need. That the enemy may be ashamed. That suffering may be alleviated. Yes, Lord. And that they also may become agents of the alleviation of suffering. That they may become agents of your kingdom deliverers repairers of the breach restorers of paths to dwell in make them agents of deliverance yes, Lord. ambassadors of the kingdom of god we bless your name mighty father we thank you for such an enormous amount of power and dominion we reign as kings in this life because of what jesus did so we honor you father we glorify you we remain dedicated to the altar of the Lord. Yes, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen and amen yes. and amen. Yes, I love you. I hope you're blessed. I love you, but Jesus loves you more. I remain Erika Mukisakimani, a.k.a. Mama Maisha or Mami Zion and Zephaniah. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and honor and power and majesty from now, henceforth, and forever. Amen. Amen. Erica, part five, altars and covenants. Breaking generational curses and destroying the power of witchcraft. This is the fifth installment of the Erica Testimonial book series. Erica reveals how the enemy takes advantage of altars and covenants, details of how these covenants affected her and her family, and how she and her family were totally set free by the power of Jesus. Get your copy of Altars and Covenants now. Visit lifeisspiritual.org.